everyone, welcome to Urbonus Podcast. I'm the host Donatos Urbonus, and we have a big guest tonight. All your league first team member, all your cup first team member, champ in Germany, Italy, Ukraine, and France, the prominent your league scorer and the real hooper you must follow on Twitter. This is Malcolm Delaney, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. I'm not interested in this year. Give it a break. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, it's a big honor uh, to have you here uh, next to my beloved co-host, the man who is a life definition of a scorer, Eric McCollum. What's up, Eric? Oh, what's up? How you guys doing? Man, honestly speaking, I feel embarrassed because yesterday when I was texting Eric about the podcast, about the topics we're going to cover, about the guest, I actually had no clue that Eric was celebrating his 35th birthday. And I won't embarrass myself again by singing happy birthday to you song <coughs> on this podcast. But please, everyone who are listening to this pod, give a few claps to one of the best uh, scorers in the continent uh, and one of the most uh, inspiring American players we have in Europe, who is still averaging 22 points per game for a, one of the leading Turkish league teams, Karşıyaka Izmir. It's, it's impressive, uh, man. It, you're just the real proof that the age is just a number. How it feels to be 35? How do you approach? <laughs> can can you compare how you approached life when you were 30, like me right now, and and now being 35? Yeah, I think um, it's just a different aspect. Um, you kind of, I've been blessed to be you know physically fit to not have any major injuries, so I haven't like slowed down quickness or you know athleticism wise. And then as you get older, you've seen so many different defenses. You kind of like adjust and know what to expect before the game even starts. So I think, um, you know, that keeps you going, keeps you sharp. And I think the biggest thing is just, uh, juggling everything, you know, now at 35, you have a family. Now I have kids and I'm trying to like manage that, you know, when I was 30, it was pretty much just, you know, all about basketball and, you know, you're trying to, you know, get your businesses running and your, your off court revenue and those type of things. But at 35, everything's kind of like flowing in. You know, I can just focus on hooping my family. So, but thank you for the birthday wishes. And hopefully I keep playing well. And, you know, Europe doesn't write me off and say I'm too old. <laughs> and be, be, before we start, Malcolm, uh, Malcolm uh, what's up with you? What you're up to right now? Because now we, we see more and more rumors coming up uh, about your potential return to Europe. Uh, just, I mean, I've been in the gym. Um, you know, just having fun with it. Honestly, I didn't, I didn't get back in the gym like planning to to make a return. I kind of just wanted to, you know, start having fun with it again, um, get back in some shape. Um, I've been dealing with this business stuff for the last uh, seven or eight months. Um, just opened my sports club five, uh, four months ago. So, you know, from the time I left Italy last season up until now I've pretty much just been locked in so you know throughout the summer I didn't have time to do both I didn't really want to do both um so like Eric was saying you know I got a chance to actually you know put some time and effort into you know something I was putting my money into and see it grow um and build it up the way I, I really wanted it to and how, how I envisioned it uh so like you said some you know it's, it's running smooth now so I've had some time to you know get back to getting in the gym you know, just trying to have fun with it. Um, so I, that's basically what I've been doing. Uh, you know, I didn't plan on doing anything specifically with it, just just trying to get back and have fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, uh, and with you particularly, but Jalgris was looking for a point guard to replace injured Keenan Evans. I know that you were in a conversation, uh, and I really think that you were the best fit for Jalgris in terms of the skill set that Keenan mm -hmm. Evans have, and what you can offer to the team uh, among the, all the other available point guards. But Jalgir has decided to go with somebody who's probably the most ready, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, physically to join them because he, Isaiah Taylor joined them very quickly to help them uh, get those two double round uh, wins in Italy, uh, which was, of course, amazing. But I mean, considering the skill set, I think that uh, Jalgir would have been uh, having the best upside, the biggest upside with Malcolm Delaney uh, on the roster. And especially now when we see Isaiah Taylor, you know, being sidelined for like three weeks, probably is the timeline for your for you to come back to your, let's say, best shape to help the team yeah. to reach the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, they called, 
I think they reached out. Um, you know, when Kenan, I think the day Kenan got hurt, but I think they were trying to move on quick. And, you know, for me, like, uh, had, the situation has to be right. I think they, Zach, Zach has a great team. I think they have one of those teams that they could probably get back to the final four with. Um, you know, just one of those sneaky teams. And, you know, in EuroLeague, once you get into the playoffs, you know, playing on a good home court, you can kind of get through anything. So, yeah, they reached out, but I don't think it was – like for me, realistically, teams got to know. Like, I mean, I can't leave. Like, it not even just physically. Like, I got a lot going on where I would have to take at least you know a little bit of time just to put stuff in order for me to leave. Um, so they, I, I think they just wanted a player uh, right then and there. I couldn't do that. Um, but yeah, it was that's a great opportunity. I could, I can pretty much fit into any system. But like you said, coming from you know losing a player his caliber, what he was doing in EuroLeague, I definitely could have fit, you know, right in to, to that role. But you know, business is business. I understood what they had to do. I wasn't really – I never talked to them. Like, personally, I never got on the phone with them. I guess they just – it just didn't fit um, from the very beginning. So we just never even got that far with talks. By the way, are you aware if Bosconia tried to reach – you out because uh, just today it was announced that probably they're terminating the contract with Peria Henry, so there they will be on the market for the point guard. And I mean, did, we don't have many point guards available at the moment. It's a tough time of the season. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure my agent will be um, reaching out to me soon. I've seen some of the injuries going on. Um, like I said, I talked to I talked to somebody Friday. I can't really announce it. Um, I had a, actually a great conversation with somebody Friday. So um, we'll see, you know, how that progresses, if it progresses. But like I said, it has to fit, you know, exactly uh, what I want. And it's like, I, if I can't go there and help somebody do what they want, I wouldn't even waste their time. So it's it's not one of those things where I'm looking to go somewhere and be a superstar or I'm looking to, you know, I, I pretty much toned down my game the last three years to fit into trying to win. Um, but I just have to be able to have fun with it. You know, I don't want to go somewhere and not have fun because I, you know, I didn't really have fun, you know, the last year or so playing basketball. Um, so if I do come back to Europe, it will have to be a situation where I know I can enjoy playing basketball, you know, being myself. I remember when we were doing the one of the early season podcasts with Eric, I think that Eric wished to see you in Partizan, right? You said that Malcolm yes. would, would, help them, would help them a lot. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> yes, I feel he was just a great fit there. Um, you know, his relationship with Punter, what we've seen, what they did in Milan together, and they were really lacking a playmaker, but someone who can go get a bucket. Like a lot of people, you know, kind of forget because Malcolm's a winner. You know, he's going to do what the team needs, but you know, Malcolm's a bucket, and if you give him that freedom, you you put him in that offense. You know, he'll make the right pass. He'll create for guys, and I felt like that was a system and a a role where we could see, you know, the Malcolm I like to see the most. You know free having fun playing this game yeah those serbian systems you know as as much as i hate like the overall you know serbian style of, of coaching you know it was like kevin and zach are really like they're my little brothers like kp is like they that year in milan we got real close like and you know they i see both of them outside of basketball like last summer you know what i'm saying i get a chance to to see both but they're really like my little brother so That was actually one of the places I joked around with them a lot about, but that was if some, if they would have called me early, like I would I probably would have got ready, despite, you know, it might not be in all the circumstances I wanted. Um, just off the fact of my relationship with them, you know, and seeing what they had going on there, I would have I would have thought about it. You know what I'm saying? That would have been one of those things was like, all right, let me because I think uh, you know, I'm my best when the team is not the front runner. Like, like you said, like put me in a system like that team is not really expected to do a lot, but they have potential to do it. I think that's when I'm at my best. They need, they needed a vet point guard. I told, I told KP that last year when they lost in Europe, I said, the only thing y'all missing is a point guard. Y'all need a vet point guard. And in your league, if you don't have a vet point guard, I don't care who else is on your team. You always going to struggle. So they, you know, they're on that fence right now and, they're definitely missing a point guard, but that was like one of those early seasons. When I seen y'all talk about that, it was funny because I used to talk to them about it all the time. And they used to be like, yo, just, man, if we call you, you got to come. Like, and I was like, shit, tell them, call me. 
<laughs> so, you know, early in the season, that was something that intrigued me just because of, you know, I never played for a fan base like that. Um, and then I never, you know, I, I really was, I was kind of hurt when KP and Zach didn't come back to Milan. You know, that was like, I, I thought that would be one of those things that we would build kind of one of those teams that stayed together for, you know, three to four years, especially after making the final four. Um, you know, KP came out, you know, he came into his own that year because people were doubting what they had, you know, with him. Even, you know, Coach Messina was kind of doubting bringing him in because he didn't know if he could fit into a system. And, you know, KP proved that on the highest level, he could do what he do. And Zach should have been the, the MVP of the Italian League that year. Um, he got snubbed for that, and we made the Final Four, but neither one of them came back. And that summer, both of them were – like, I, KP was here. Um, he came to Atlanta, and we talked about it when he – actually signed with Partizan, he was telling me like he wanted to come back to Milan and then it just didn't work out. And then with the Zach situation, it was kind of the same. Like I was talking to Zach, I had talked to Messina and then it just kind of happened. And that's, that's surprising. crazy. But, Yo, know, one shot like, away from the final. That's yeah, insane. So, not to bring so, that core back. You know, he wasn't really asking for something crazy. Like he was a leading scorer on our team in Euroleague. And then he had a big final four. Like that game in Barcelona, he was, you know, he was, we was one shot away from, you know, making it to the final. He could have hit it, but he killed that game. And uh, I thought he, you know, earned it, but it's business. But, yeah, that was uh, intriguing to me just because of my relationship with them uh, and just seeing what they were doing at parties on knowing the historic value of that, that club. Honestly, I was a bit surprised that Partizan didn't make this adjustment with the point guard. I mean, remembering the, the the last season. Okay, I have nothing against Dante Exum, but it's still a huge adjustment for him. I mean, when He's he came to guard. Europe, <laughs> exactly. When he came to Europe, he played like as a wing, I would say, as a small forward. And now you have to be a playmaker of Jelko Bradovic's team. So I believe the last year was a huge lesson for them already. So I was a bit surprised that they decided to keep experimenting on these uh, point guards. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's what I felt, but it was, like I said, like I, I kind of, um, you know, I talked to like Mike, I talked to those, like the, the guys that I'm really, really close with, I was, I was speaking with, because honestly, like after my last season in Milan, I unfollowed every basketball page, Euroleague, you know, um, Euro hoops, like everybody, I kind of needed to separate my, I completely separate. I didn't know who signed where, like I checked back in like August, uh, September. I didn't even know like who signed where, what was going on. I literally distanced myself from basketball. I didn't know. And still like until this day, I can't tell you everybody who's on every team. Cause I, you know, I watch, like I said, I'll watch Milan. Sometimes if I got time, I'll watch Mike, you know, with Monaco, I'll watch Partizan sometimes. So I'll see, you know, some of those games, but I really had no clue what was going on <laughs> besides like the team that my, my friends are uh, playing on. Gotcha. Anyways, we'll try to get through some big topics uh, for this week, including Shabazz Napier addition uh, to Planet Nikos. It's not official yet, but it's happening. Uh, we will try to share. Malcolm just mentioned that he has some teams he's watching more than others, but we'll try to share our first FS Big Free uh, impressions. Uh, we'll try to mention the biggest falls and jumps in the EuroLeague. And I, I believe that the all-time EuroLeague American Five will be intriguing and the rules that would make the NBA more exciting. I'm not sure if we will have time to cover all those topics, but at least we'll try to get uh, through most of them. So everyone just relax, get yourself comfortable, press like button below this video at first, subscribe uh, our YouTube channel and all the other channels you're following our podcast and just enjoy it. So, so guys, one of the hottest news uh, this Monday was that Pant Nikos is very close to signing Shabazz Napier who was killing in Zenit last year in the preseason, but got injured and actually n never really played uh, that year. He already returned to Europe, uh, at, let's say made his debut in Europe after not playing in the NBA for, for one year. Uh, what do you think about this adjustment, uh, th about this addition? Do you think that this uh, season uh, changing adjustment for Pantnaikos or they are done? I think it um you know it can put them in a positive light in a positive direction. You know I think right now they're four games out of the playoffs. It's 
really difficult in this year league to make up four games. You got to give him time to adjust um, to his teammates, to adapt, to build chemistry, to understand what the coach wants from him. But his talent is undeniable. Um, Shabazz is, is a really good point guard. Um, he can lead. He's tough defensively. He can score. And he'll make the game easier for other players. I think, you know, the ball has to go in his hands. That could take away from Bacon. You know, he's very ball dominant, um, extremely aggressive. But maybe, you know, maybe having less touches, not having as much responsibility could raise his efficiency as well. So, but I don't see playoffs in them, even with Shabazz, just because it's so late in the year. But I do see them, you know, being way more competitive, offensive uh, efficiency increasing and them, you know, having a direction. You know, sometimes when you watch their games, it looks like they just give the ball to Bacon and just praise that he's able to, to make something happen. Well, with Shabazz, they could actually have an offense and creativity and flowing and multiple people touching the ball and reversals and type of things like that. Yeah. That's, like you said, I feel the same way. He, uh, I don't think it'll be a changer where it pushes them over the edge because this time in the season, you know, it's, it's still teams like F is straddling the line, you know, trying to get in the playoff. You still have some of these teams that's um, probably predicted to be in a playoff that, you know, got off to a late start because of maybe injury because of, whatever but these teams know how to win so you know you always put those caliber teams you know if they're in that eight through ten uh you gotta you gotta look out for those guys and then you got some teams that got hot like basconian um that that are in there that you know they just lost four straight or they just lost three or four straight in Euroleague, league and you know they might have some tough games coming up so i think for panther i goes i think it's putting them in the right direction um I think better off in the, the Greek league, you know, trying to challenge for that that title in Greek Greece rather than you know Euro league playoffs. But um, I think it'll help them out. But adapting to a fan base like that, I think one thing for him is that's a hostile fan base for opponents and for the home players. So if you throw somebody in a fire like that, you know, the fans expect him to come in and be the savior. And I'm not sure if he's ever been in that situation in his career where, you know, he has to actually go in there with that type of environment. Um, and if he doesn't play well, you know, the fans don't care if, you know, he's coming late trying to help, you know, they, they going to be on him. Um, but if he does play well, I think they will really embrace him. And I think that's the caliber player he is. Like he's exciting. Like you said, he can score, he can actually run the team. So I think, um, I honestly believe it'll help him more on a positive end, but also you got to be realistic in Europe and with some of those fan bases, if he has one or two bad games, you know, it could be the total opposite. So like you said, that adjustment is the biggest thing for him because we all know he can play. It's just, you know, how he adapts to that environment. Yeah, I think that at least a good thing is that he already had this, okay, it was a short experience with Zenit, but he had this European experience last season. And now he's coming off a solid G League season where he was averaging 22 points for a Mexico uh, City team, which was eight and three uh, in the G League. Uh, next to guys like Mason Jones, Gary Clark, there were some players like Kenneth Farid or Bruno Caboclo. Uh, and I think that for Pant I mean, it's a, it's a huge boost. I'm not sure if it will be enough uh, to make the playoffs. It's a huge adjustment for everybody in the team, which was trying to fit in next to Dwayne Bacon and his style of play. So now there's another big adjustment coming in the end of January. So as you said, there's not much time left to make those adjustments to become a playoff team. But it's going to be interesting. And uh, I'm just wondering who will be left out of the rotation because I see Napier, although he's a you know in a point guard body, he's a scorer for your team. And I believe that he could fit well next to Nate Walters. And... You know, and I believe that Marius Grigonis might be losing his role in this team. He couldn't find his rhythm uh, so far this year. And there were already some rumors that they might do the same what they did for Andrew Andrews, like shutting him down. So I believe that this this signing is is not not good news for Grigonis' future in, in Athens, or at least for this season. Sound about right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how it goes for, for Pana. I mean, because when you put all those names individually besides somewhere, you know, it's it's a very nice team. I mean, you have Paris Lee as a great on-ball defender. Now we have Shabazz Napier, 
Nate Walters had a great season under Rodonjic last year and Tervenes Vesda was an important piece of that underdog team which made a playoff run, didn't make it, but still they were challenging uh, until the end. Mateusz Ponitka is a glue guy. He was a very important piece of, of Zenit last year for Xavi Pascal. Then there's Derek Williams. Bacon was great in, in Monaco. Papayanis looked like, you know, that up-and-coming center in the EuroLeague. So when you put those pieces aside, it's, it looks like a solid roster, but probably, you know, the damage was too big in the beginning of the season. The question is if they can have this good chemistry uh, to be together, uh, to click together one more time for, for, for a spark, for a great run. Because I think that what's good for Panathinaik was that this EuroLeague is so tight this year that we see examples like Basconia, they were on the top of the standings. They lose four in a row and they're like on the brink of losing the playoffs. So it's also, I mean, the same situation in the bottom of the standings. So who knows? Some 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 wins can change the situations directly. But from, from your voice, I don't hear much positivity regarding their playoff chances, right? Yeah, I'd say slim to none. Yeah, it's tough. And uh, like you said, in, I mean, yearly period, like that playoff picture is, is, is tough. Um, and like I said, there's veteran teams that, I mean, I like Panthenagos on paper, but if you put them against a team with, you know, with, with a lot of veterans, um, <clears throat> I give them the edge. Yeah. By the way, I was a bit surprised by Ettore Messina and his quote. Uh, following the last defeat, I think it was against uh, Villarban. He said that basically their EuroLeague season done is done, although we have 14 game, games remaining and they're like four or five wins away from the playoffs and they're like top five budget team in the EuroLeague. Is it is it is it weird to hear it from the head coach and from a, such a you know caliber head coach with so so many games to play? Yeah, I think it's um. Not normal at all. Just because how can you motivate the guys? How can you get them to come in to practice every day? How can you get them to to take that extra effort to do the little things if you're saying that the season's over? Okay, we know realistically they're probably dead. You know, then it's not easy to turn on the light switch for something to change. Offensively, they're they're stagnant. It's horrible. It's bad basketball. Um, they're not creating any uh, advantages. You know, there's no closeout attacks. Um, there's no ball reversals. There's no open threes. Um, you know, there's nobody able to create an easy bucket, even for themselves. So I'm um, just seeing the offensive struggle that they have. Um, it looks like nobody's having fun. You know, it's guys who have a lot of talent who played well in other systems and other teams. And then they got there and it's like almost like Space Jam, like guys lost their powers. And so you're just sitting there and you're like, what happened? Like, like you know, these players are good players. You have like the, the resumes, you have the track record of the different teams, places they've been. And so something has to change, something has to give. But I think that throwing the towel, I don't know if it's a motivational tactic or, you know, a mind games, you know, in Europe, a lot of coaches do those type of things. But, you know, it's disheartening to see, um, you know, him kind of giving up already, even though we know, like, it's probably over for them. Man. You know, when you already spend so much money, I, I don't even think adding another player helps you um, at this point. Yeah, and, um, you know, being on the inside of that, um for two years, that was one of the things, you know, we always, well, for me personally, I'm a vocal leader. Um, so um, that was always one of the things I, I challenged coach with, you know, coach is probably one of my favorite coaches, but, you know, sometimes he gets defeated and <clears throat> it's one of those situations where the players have to kind of motivate him. And you can tell that he's like, um, he's trying everything that he can, but, it's deflating like when it doesn't work when something doesn't work that you're so used to working it looks like coach is just a little deflated um and you know he said that and like you said realistically it kind of looks like that they can't really bounce back from what they got going you know Siobhan is still hurt um, and that's the biggest piece that's pretty much what they centered everything around the offense is based around Siobhan um, and without him it's tough um so, yeah, it's tough to say it publicly, but the thing about that is that's a way for Coach to challenge the team. But the biggest thing about Milan is they don't have a player, I think, besides maybe Kyle. And everybody knows Kyle's not the biggest vocal leader. Kyle's more of a coming to work every day, work hard. If it gets too bad, Kyle will, you know, step up and, 
and shut it down. But they need somebody who can challenge coach. Uh, you know, if somebody says something like that, somebody has to step up and say, you know, we don't believe it. Like, you have to go to practice the next day and challenge each other. You might have to have a, a, a fight, not, you know, physically, but, like, some kind of fight amongst the players, you know, some kind of argument with the coaches. Just a challenge to kind of start rebuilding your focus onto something else because coming from where, you know, we were the last two years looking at that, it deflates the fans as well. So, you know, if you have the team losing, it seems like everything is not going right, you know, the the team is already in a bad mood because they feel like, you know, they're not doing enough. And then once the coach kind of loses it, now the fans start seeing quotes like that. Now, once they get in the games, it's doing nothing but putting more pressure on the team. So now every missed shot, every turnover, you know, everything is just enhanced. And, you know, for them right now, they're in a bad spot. And I think more positivity, you know, definitely from coach, you know, in the media. But I think it's just getting to the point now where it's like, he would be lying to himself and to, you know, the fans if he went in the media and said, you know, we're trying to make a playoff push. I think they probably realistically shifted their their focus onto the Italian league, um, knowing that they can't really do much in Euroleague right now. It's just not going their way. And I think coach's main focus is going to be on trying to win that Italian league. And they have a cup coming up. I think if they win the cup and then they win the Italian league, they'll kind of forget about Euroleague. They won't you know, worry about it as much. So I think that's kind of what he's saying. Like, he wants to shift his focus on, you know, trying to take care of, because that, that stuff matters to Mr. Armani. Like, that that Italian stuff, like, EuroLeague is big, it's great for the fans, it's great for European basketball, but you could have a bad EuroLeague year there. And if you win the Cup, if you win the Italian League, I think the fans are happy. They can restart next year and try EuroLeague, but I just think they're, they're drained. You can see it. Like, every game they play, you can see – or you can call from here exactly what's going to happen at what time in the game. And it just looks like coaches drain. Yeah. Yeah, probably it was also part of his mind games because it's not the first time he's throwing statements like that. I believe that in the playoff series last year against FS, he also said something like, okay, the series are over. I I think that Milan was like 0-2 or something, but he, he, yeah. he, he said things like that. But, yeah. you know... And, you know, Messina is in this situation where he has privilege to throw statements like this because the, he's also the president of basketball operations. He has this huge respect uh, and, and trust uh, from the ownership because at the same time, if, for example, Brandon Davis was coming out with statements like that, I mean, I, I'm just curious to see what's going next for the player like him, 14 games yeah. remaining into the season or like... Uh, Panathinaikos head coach Dan Radonich throws a statement like that. He's he's fired as soon as he as as the quote makes the makes the headlines. So <laughs> it's 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 an interesting it's just, situation to observe. Yeah, this power for sure, um, and like you said, a lot of people can't get away with that. Um, but it's, I think the people in that club kind of understand uh, Ettore, and it's kind it's it's not a surprise for the people close to them. They kind of know his motivational tactics. They know, you know, his personality. Um, and like I said, he's one of those guys. Like, if he, I think genuinely, he he realistically believes that. But like he thinks that they need to refocus on something else. And sometimes he'll say it out loud. Like some, you know, some things you don't think people would typically say out loud. You know, he'll say it. But like I said, is they need somebody on the team that could. Like, I if I seen that, I would have posted some someone on Twitter. <laughs> like I would have, I would have been like, man, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's just me. And some people love it. Some people hate it. But like, for me, I'm always going to have my teammates back. And, you know, that was one thing. And sometimes even me and coach butt heads because of that, like, you know, he might say something like that. And I would literally stand up in the middle of the speech, like, yo, like, nah, that's like, we're not going to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like coach, like, this is what we're going to do. The game is not over. Like we've been down 20 before and I've gotten in, you can ask anybody on our team. We'll be down. I think I forgot the game last year. We might have been down 20 points. We went to the locker room and coach, like, you know, he walked out, like stormed out. And I was like, look, bro, like, we know what we can do. We're going to win the game. You know, even like sometimes I felt like the game was out of reach. I knew what kind of power, firepower we had. And I knew that, you know, sometimes coaches' tactics don't work. Like he could do that and leave. And then we would be in the locker room like, bro, like, if he don't care, then why should we care? 
But if you don't have a guy in the locker room that can challenge that, and, you know, some people are scared to say something. Like, I wasn't scared to say nothing. Chacha wasn't scared to say something. When something wasn't going right, or, you know, coach went through one of those moods, me and Chacha were the ones that we didn't care. Like, coach could be mad at me, but if everybody on the team bought into, you know, trying to win, I would always take that. Like, I would rather the coach be mad at me than to be mad at everybody. And I think with making statements like that, they need a player that'll go against that, who truly believes that, you know, they can actually win, but I don't think they have that. And, you know, having a guy, like I said, like Kyle, this is the most games Kyle probably lost in his career. Like, I, I talked to Kyle when they lost, I think, like two or three. He was like, you know what I'm saying? He, he never lost that many games before. So I can't imagine losing 10 or, you know, eight or nine and how the mood is around there. Because I know how it was losing two games. So I know right now they're in a bad spot. But, you know, that's, that's just coach. I, I don't think um, I wouldn't take it too serious. I know some of those players on the team can't take that. But like I said about Panthenikos, they have so much pressure right now because we just won the Italian League. We just won the Cup. You know, we went to the Final Four. Now that they're doing how they're doing now, everything is enhanced. Like, and I know how that fan base is because, you know, they turned on me at one point. <laughs> and, you know what I'm saying? So I, I know how it is being into that fire. Yeah, and probably we all agree that Milan, you know, they made the biggest fall in the EuroLeague. At this point of the season last year, they were like in the top four and probably we all saw them in the final four uh, this season. But now the situation is, is is completely opposite. What about the biggest jumps, Eric, for instance? What do you like the most uh, about the most improved teams compared to the last season? So for me, um, there was, you know, three teams that stood out. Um, one was Finner. But I expected them to make that jump with the Tudors coming over, with the firepower, with all the signings, all the experiences, players, and you know just the talent they had. It just screamed Final Four team. So I had to throw them away. Like, okay, they did what I expected of them, but it was a huge jump. Congratulations. And then the other two was Zagiris and um, Basconia. Like, when you looked at the preseason, there's no way you looked at those names on both of those teams and thought playoffs. You for sure thought bottom dwellers, um, lack of experience, um, some good players, some quality, but like they were going to be one of those uh, gritty teams who battled through. You know, they kind of reminded me of those those Red Star rosters. You know, that lacked that that big name, uh, but they're good collectively, but not good enough to make the playoffs. And then you look, and you know, I think um, you know they're both for me. I couldn't choose one; I had to go with both of them just because you know the jump they made. Marcus Howard adapting that fast for Basconia. Like I knew he was a hooper. Like I knew like he could shoot the ball. I knew he could, but I didn't think it would translate this quickly um, because most guys who come, you know, to Europe the first time is it's a learning process. Um, you know, it's ups and downs and, you know, he really just caught fire and, you know, took over to the early by storm for them. And then I already knew what Darius Thompson could do. You know, I said he was um, the most underrated player going to the early just because people didn't know him. He was young, but he has size. He um, can defend. He can really pass. Um, you know, he was my point guard last year. So like he, he's a hooper. And, but I still didn't think like, you know, those two players both know your elite experience, no way they're playoffs. Right. And it comes out that they are. And then Zalgiris, you know, in that same breath, you know, Heenan Evans, I knew he was a good player, but I never seen him in the leading role, you know, at, at Maccabi, you know, he was kind of learning a little bit going through, you know, your elite for the first time. And you've seen the flashes, you've seen the talent, but you didn't see a bona fide leader. And I think Zagiris forced him to really grow up. And, you know, he really put everything on display and showed me that he was underutilized at Maccabi, you know, from seeing what he could do now. And I think, um, you know, just their growth, what they were able to do, and then him getting hurt and then still winning, still uh, finding a way to be um, a problem for teams. You know, I think those two teams are the, the biggest jump and the most impressive yeah, same for me. I think um, if I had to choose one, though, I probably would go with South Harris. Um And just playing them last year, I think, you know, Basconia still had a couple pieces last year. Um, they just weren't there. You know, South Harris was pretty bad. Like, they were bad last year. Um, and historically, South Harris always has a great point guard. Like, that's one of the places I could say, like, if a, a player wanted to establish itself, especially American, um, 
go to Jacques Garrett's. You know, over the years, they've always mm-hmm. had great point guards. They've always given mm-hmm. people opportunities. Mm-hmm. And I think American guards always thrive in that environment. Um, and I think that's what Keenan Evans did because, I, like I said, I didn't really see it last year. You could see flashes. You know, he's athletic, great defender. But his role in Maccabi wasn't anything, really. He just came in and did what he had to do. Um, and I think he thrived in that like typical American guards going to Zagiris. Um, and that changed the dynamic of their team. They had, I think it gives those Lithuanian players and the guys around them a little bit more confidence when you have a lead guard like that. So some of those guys that, you know, typically wouldn't be the, the, as confident going into games now, you know, they're not scared of anybody. You know, and then you had a couple uh, key players um, and now they take that next step. So it's like, it's a balance of, you know, adding a few of the right pieces uh, along with having that lead guard. And we've been talking about how having a lead guard in your league uh, is the biggest thing. And if you have a great point guard, as long as you've got great role players, you can win in your league. I think, you know, that any team like that, and you can get to the final four based on a great system and having good lead guards. Um, and I think along with that crowd playing at home, um, you know, that just gets the team in a good rhythm. Um, and they can run games off. And it's hard to beat them at home, even when they're not good. You know, they last year they challenged a lot of a lot of teams. They just didn't have the firepower to get them over the top. So I think this year, you know, they have a little bit more firepower. Now everybody's, you know, one year uh, more into their yearly careers. People are more confident. Uh, you get a couple players, Lithuanian players that were playing other places that get to come back home, you know, with bigger roles. Uh, and, you know, they just changed everything around. Now, I think, you know, I picked them as being the most dangerous team just because of their home crowd, just because of, you know, how they play at home. That's for me, that's they went from, you know, like I said, one of the worst teams to probably one of the most dangerous teams in Euro League. Yeah, the, the confidence you mentioned, it also comes from the head coach, uh, Kazis Maxvitis. He's basically Euroleague, he's basically a rookie coach. He had one Euroleague season, but it was like that old format Euroleague and it was a whole different uh, league. So confidence comes from the head coach because he doesn't put you in a, some strict system. He gives freedom to his players and especially to those players who you can rely on, like Keenan Evans, uh, Ignaz Brezdekis is starting to play uh, way better. So he has like clear scores of your team and gives the keys of his team. And other ga- uh, players like Elgar Sulano was making step back three pointers. I mean, what we are even talking about. And that, that comes from the confidence, uh, which comes from the head coach, because they were working like uh, since Sulano was, was 10 years old in, in Kona's basketball school. So I think huge credit goes also for the head coach, because in today's Euro League, with basically all these teams, they play like 70, 80 games per season. It's, it's huge. They're playing every two, three days. And some of these coaches, they still try to put their players in some some system, you know, to, 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 to try to do something else from them, except from letting him letting them to be themselves, uh, basically. I don't have that feeling with this head coach, Max Vitesen. I think it's it's a huge, huge thing for him moving forward and making him his name uh, in the EuroLeague. But yeah, I would also give credit to, to Basconia, basically because they brought a lot of new players and Euro, uh, EuroLeague rookies. I mean, three of their four top scorers are rooks. Uh, Marcus Howard, Darius Thompson, Mike Kotsar, big man uh, as well. They have the EuroLeague uh, rookie head coach. So they went through some kind of rebuild, but they completely changed the system. They're far away from Dusko Ivanovic, uh, you know, basketball uh, school. The new head coach, Penaroa, is more open-minded uh, coach. And I just love them. I mean, they're one of the deepest teams in terms of, I wouldn't say quality. It's not like the depth of CSKA Moscow of their old, old times or, or Barcelona or Real Madrid, for instance. They have 10 players who play at least 16 minutes per game and they average at least six points. And they just have this one clear go-to guy like uh, Marcus Howard. Other than that, it's it's a beautiful team to watch. They're very fun to watch, especially when they're playing uh, in front of their home crowd. Yeah, they have that typical uh, ACB team. It's like usually that's how, <coughs> that's how Spanish teams are built. Like you look in the ACB, usually those teams, like when people go in ACB, you don't see anybody averaging 16, 18 points. 
um, or 25 plus minutes. You go there, everybody's playing between 15, 22 to 23 minutes. Um, and they'd rather play a 10 man rotation and have a deep roster. And like you said, you got one or two guys, you know, before um, Henry got hurt. He's a pure point guard, but he's also a threat to get 20. You know, he can get 20 and 10. He, he's one of those guys who are double double, triple double threat. The way he plays, his energy. Uh, like you said, with Marcus Howard, he's a streaky guy too. He's the one player in their team that can get 30. So when you put that on, you know, on track with eight or nine other guys that can always give you something day in and day out with, like you said, with the freedom of a new coach, that's not strict. It looks like they just have fun playing basketball. You know, there's no restrictions on what they do. Um, and in EuroLeague, it's, you don't see it as often, but when you do see it, players love it. And, you know, players adapt to that system more um, than I think being strict and doing everything the same way because a Marcus Howard wouldn't be great in a, system, a strict system. He wouldn't be able to do what he does um, in a strict system. So, you know, allowing him to take two, two or three bad shots because you know he can get hot and hit five or six in a row. Like everybody don't have the patience with, especially with rookie guards in Euroleague. That never happens. It's rare that they let a rookie come in and do that. And Basconia being that um, historically good team, you know, they always expect to win. Even when they're bad or they don't have a great roster. I feel like in Basconia, they always have, you know, their fans are always great. Um, and they just always have that that mentality that they're one step away and they're right behind Barca and Madrid. And I think this year, you know, being tied, I think in the ACB, I think they're at the top two. Um, you know, I don't, I'm sure like a couple of weeks ago, they were like tied for first. Um, and they were up there in EuroLeague now. They lost a couple, but I think they really believe they can play, you know, with anybody. And like you said, it was out here. Wants to get that confidence, you know, it's, it's hard to beat teams like that. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, I, I love Basconia. Yeah. Just watching them, like the way they play, the way the ball moves. Like you can tell when players really like each other, like they're happy for each, each other's success. When Marcus Howard is hitting, you know, six, seven threes, the whole bench is engaged. Everyone's happy. When um, Perry Henry's getting the assists or Darius Thompson getting a, a no look pass, like, like you can just see the joy that they play with. And like y'all said, like the coach has done an excellent job. And for sure, you know, if they can maintain their status, you know, he's for sure a coach of the year candidate just because of the low expectation from the outside of that squad going into this year elite season. Yeah. And actually, for a fact, Basconi is a top four in ACB, but I mean, they're two wins away from being the first uh, seed over there. And y y you mentioned good thing, Malcolm, about a uh, great fit for Basconia because I, we just had this conversation back in the day. What if Marcus Howard was playing in Fenerbahce under Coach Etudis? Let's let's say in, in, in the situation of Carson Edwards. I mean, He'd be Carson Edwards. He'd be the exact same. <laughs> a good like, player, a good player on the leash. A great game, and then you might disappear for, you know, three or four games. And for a score, especially for a young score, that's tough to deal with <laughs> in, in Europe. That's, that's one of the biggest adjustments you have to make, knowing that he can get 30 any night, anywhere. Like he, I, I think he's one of those players that you can put into any environment. He can just score. Like he'll get you because he can shoot so well and from so many different levels. He's just, a, a, a like you said, he's a, a 30 threat anywhere. And if you tone a guy like that down, you don't know, you know what I'm saying, what you could get there. There'll never be consistency if you don't just let them um, be yourself. And I think they they let them be yourself, and that's rare in, in yearly, especially for a rookie. Yeah, and, and it's not that, you know, it do this is a bad coach and it's a bad way for him. I mean, he's a proven winner. He's a two-time EuroLeague uh, champ and, you know, he's doing a good job at Fenerbahce, but it's, it's the matter of fit and the way those coaches uh, see their teams and their approach. But I was just wondering, you know, uh, what do you guys think of, of uh, situations like that? I mean, what would be your advice to some great scorers coming to Europe and when you were, uh, let's say, at, when you were 27, 28, 26, when you had these offers on the table, were you picking teams, you know, based on the head coaches they have, the philosophy they run, or you were not that really aware of that? And maybe you even got in some tough situations. Yeah, when I was 26 or 27, I always looked at... Um, the coach, their style, the flow of the game. But I also looked at who was there before me that played my position. Did they have freedom? Did they have a green light? Um, 
how did they perform? Where did they go after that season? You know, those are, you know, key questions that you need to ask yourself before you take on that job. And, you know, just to get um, familiar with what you might be going into, um, because no matter how talented you are, um, if you go to a coach who doesn't like to play rookies or who doesn't give that freedom, um, your season is going to be very up and down. And people will mistake that as you being inconsistent, but really it's the coach's role that he's giving you in the minutes. Like no matter how talented you are, um, you can't perform at the level you're capable of if you've been handcuffed, if certain shots you can't take, or if when you do take those shots, you're coming out the game. And I think um, for like Carson Edwards, example, I think he's a really talented player, but um, with so many weapons on that team, um, you know, there's only so many guys who are going to have the green light. You know, everyone can't have the green light. And so the coach makes their decisions. So you're going to see him have some nights where you're like, man, he's special, but then you're going to see him, you know, struggle. And I think that's why Marcus Howard, you know, is doing so well because, you know, he's given that freedom, but he also picked a team. And this is what I always did. Pick a team that needs you, not a team that wants you. Um, a team that needs you, they have no choice but to let you play your game, no choice but to give you freedom. And, and if they don't do that, the team will probably struggle. Um, but a team that just wants you, you know, those are usually – the Cheskas, the Barcelona, they don't need you. They just want you. And sometimes they'll sign guys just so that another team can't have them so they don't have to play against them or they'll sign a guy, and, you know, just to make the, the final picture, you know, look so complete. But where do you fit? You know, you're just a, a, a small piece to the puzzle, maybe a little corner piece, you know, where you can pick a team that, you know, really can enhance your career. And I think that's what a lot of young players have to look at. Sometimes maybe you take a little less money, but you'll be happy. And you'll be able to play your game and you'll be able to sustain your career. And that's a mistake a lot of people don't make. Yeah, and it was the same way with me. I think <clears throat> my first uh my first three years was all situational. You know, I came in uh, my, my rookie year when I went to Shalom. I think uh, Marquez Haynes was there before me. He had a big year. Um, you know, my agent was like, look, I got a player there. He's the only person leaving from that team. They have a good veteran team. I need you to go in. Winning is going to, you know, get you to your next deal. I already know you're going to play well. You know, going into Europe as a scorer, I wasn't a point guard coming into Europe. Like, I played combo, but I was more of a playmaker. But everybody knew me as a scorer. So, you know, I went to France. I replaced Marquez, and I looked at him. I'm like, look, you know, he's averaging 13 or 14. If I could come in and do the same thing, you know, I'll make this team a lot better. So that was my mentality my rookie year. I went in. You know, they accepted me. They let me do what I do. Um, and I fit right in. And we won everything in France just because I could fill that void that they were having with, leave, with losing him. And then I seen he went and played in ACB. So he got, you know, after playing good that year, like Eric said, he went somewhere better. So I'm like, if I go, I had something to look after. Then, you know, my second year when I went to Budapest, you know, they had Jack McClinton there the year before me. I seen what he did in Budapest. I'm like, okay, you know, Jack is like a big brother to me. He can score. He had the freedom there. He said he liked playing there, you know. So I had bigger deals. I could have went to Azamines for more money. I could have went to some of these other places. I could have stayed in France and played Euroleague. But I thought the best thing for my career was to go somewhere where I could develop. Um, so, you know, I left. I went to Ukraine, developed, took less money, but took the right fit. Worked out perfect. You know, you go to a Final Four, then it got challenging. Then my agent called me. He was like, look. The point guards and four men in Europe are getting paid. You want to make real money, you need to play point guard. So, you know, Munich came and, you know, he's like, look, it's a crazy head coach, Serbian guy. Uh, if you could go here and survive one year, he's like, it's going to change your whole dynamic of your European career. If you could go prove you can play point guard, you know, tone down the scoring, be more efficient, show people that you can run a team, it's going to change everything for you. So, like Eric said, you know, I chose another situation where it was opportunity where I could, you know, challenge myself a little bit, but also they gave me the keys. So I, you know, I had a, the best of both worlds. It's like, try something new, but also they telling me like, look, this is your team. As a rookie coming into the EuroLeague, I got put into a situation like a Marcus Howard where they just told me like, you have the ability to make mistakes. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I didn't have to look over my shoulder playing in Munich because, um, you know, they told me from day one that, this is your team. We want you to do this. I had a coach that, you know, was strict, but also was good with guards, um, you know, and I excelled in that. And then, you know, you move forward and then, you know, in locomotive, it was, you know, it was the biggest money in my career. 
went into a team that probably was the best team in Europe as a Euro Cup team um, that year. Um, and it was just a new opportunity for me to do something different. And then moving forward, you know, like you said, with a Barcelona, with a Milan, you know, I had to tone it down and look and say, OK, do I fit in here as a team player? I can't so much be myself. I get to go in spurts where I could be myself. But what's going to help us win is, you know, buying into a system. And I think at 26 and well, 27, 28, when I came back to Europe, I understood that more than when I was 21 or 22. You know, I, I wanted to score at 22. And at 28, 29, I can go to Barcelona <clears throat> and take a back seat, but also still be myself and know how to pick and choose spots, you know, with trying to win. So, uh, you know, like Eric said, it's it's a balance between picking, you know, who wants you and who needs you. And they don't know who want and need them yet. They just see, you know, a good offer, you, you know, coming to Europe for the first time or second time. The first thing is going to be the money. And then the second thing is going to be, you know, if they could win, but they don't really understand once you get into the fire of your league that, you know, whatever they told you in that summertime to get you there, <laughs> you know, that, that's not going to happen during the season. And, you know, it's not enough minutes or enough opportunities for you to do it. So, um, like you said, it's, it's Carson Edwards and Marcus Howard is two different. It's a slippery slope between being who they really are and, you know, what the team needs. And you can just see that both of those are the same caliber players, but, you know, one is on the Final Four team, one is on the team that's been playoff, and you're going to play two different roles in those two different teams. Yeah, and going to our next topic, do you think Will Clyburn was somebody who FS wanted or needed? What would be your first impressions of this big three playing together? Because uh, due to Shane Larkin's injury, they just come to play together four rounds ago against Maccabi and it, it, they're so far they're one and three in four games per advanced stats with this free player combo FS was actually plus nine in 87 possessions they're usually outplaying opponents by four points per hundred possessions but these are only advanced stats what what would be your just feel, first feels on watching Clyburn uh, Larkin and Vasily Misic playing together so if you go back to the summer you got to put things into context Kleber was somebody they needed. Um, Misic was in the NBA limbo. Um, you're thinking like maybe he's going to leave. You got two back-to-back -back league titles. You're talking about the MVP. And you can feel that he's eager to go to the NBA. So as a team, do you wait and see what maybe happens? And then you're stuck on the market. And as we see, there's a limit of guards. It's not a lot of big-time guards available, guys who can play at that level. And so to find somebody like Kyburn is somebody who's experienced, who can score, who can defend, who can rebound, who can pose. You can play through him. So he gives you that luxury of, okay, if Mises goes, we still have a guy who's a first team all year league caliber. Then you also have to keep in mind, you know, with Shane's injury history, with the problems he had with the knees, you know, him missing that time, how bad they were when Shane was out um, the last two years at the start of the season, you know, how the panic button was hit. And now you bring in a guy like Clyburn who keeps things afloat, who can keep things going so that when Shane does come back, you're not 0-5, 0-4, you know, however they started, you're, you're in the mix. Maybe the record's not great, but, you know, right now they're in the mix. They're one game out the playoffs, you know, 10 wins. Um, they're right there. And, um, you know, with the one good double week, you know, that could jump from, from ninth place to, to six or seven, you know, just like that. And then, um, the rich get richer, you know, every year that you win, the target gets bigger, it's harder and harder to, to replicate that success. So when you're given a guy of that caliber, I mean, it's almost impossible to say no. Um, I think right now, um, I think Will is taking a step back when I think he should still be aggressive and still assert himself. I think, um, he's extremely talented and I think he's trying to fill out Shane. I think he's trying to fill out, you know, how he fits in you know, with Mises because they won two championships and, you know, he's a winner, you know, so he's trying to figure out, all right, I want us to still be successful. Um, I know I can't be as aggressive, you know, but he's a guy that can find points that can do other things, you know, that are valuable on the score sheet and off. Um, and I think once he gets comfortable, because remember it's only three or four games in, once he gets comfortable with Shane's spots, with Mises' spots, once they see where they can use him, um, I think it's a situation where you'll see them all start to thrive together. And I think they can also cut back on some of Misic and Larkin's minutes, you know, for the purpose of keeping them fresh. And that will allow Clyburn to have time 
on the court to do what he does or Shane to do what he does. Like when you play all three together, you know, 33, 34 minutes is extremely difficult, you know, to really fill the game. And that's when injuries occur. That's when players get wore out and to keep them fresh for the playoffs. I think it only makes sense to cut back on the minutes some and to give them each times throughout the game to be the focal point of the offense. That's how I would do if I was their coach. Yeah, and that's the same. And it's, I think, you know, Ephesus is dangerous because they're one of the most confident teams. They have one of the most confident coaches. They don't care what, what position they're in right now. You know, they can figure it out. They got 14 weeks, whatever it is, to figure it out. As long as they get into the playoffs, I feel like they don't care if they're eight or they're one. Once they get there, they truly believe they can win. And I think, you know, Adam Will was, like you said, they needed him in the summertime. But I also think they did need – um, him moving forward because they needed that extra piece. You know, I, not because I played him along last year, but like we were injured during the playoffs. So, you know, FS caught us at a time where, you know, I got hurt, you know, Chacho was hurt, Siobhan was hurt. Um, and like you said earlier, like coach felt like, you know, we would, it was over for us, but <clears throat> they might catch a team like a Fenerbahce or they might catch a team like a Barcelona this year where, you know, Visage and Larkin might not be enough. And I think when you try to three-peat, you have to add one of those pieces. And Will is the best, you know, wing in, in Europe. And if you can put him alongside two of the best guards in Europe, nobody's going to turn that down. And like you said, it's also one of those things, even though Will has been probably top two or three players in Euroleague so far, you still bring him back Shane, you know, one of the most, the highest paid players historically one of the best guards over the last couple of years um, and a focal point of efforts where it's going to take a challenge for Will to say, like you said, do I stay aggressive or do I take a step back and try to integrate Shane back into this because they know in the long term they need all three. Um, so I think I think that's on the coach, like you said, to balance their minutes, to let all three of them get their opportunity because at the end of the day, we know it's Mises, Mises show. He's going to take the big shots, you know, but also you now you have two other threats that could potentially take the last shot. So that just makes efforts more dangerous. If they manage it the right way, I think they're going to be tough down the road. I don't think, you know, historically they're, they're as good as they were before, but they have the potential to be better. I think if, if it starts clicking at the right time, it's going to be tough, um, you know, on both ends because Will brings it offensively and defensively, he makes it tough. He's one of the biggest matchup nightmares because he can defend one through five. And also he could play the four position. So, you know, you could play all three of them together with a shooter and it just makes it dangerous for Europe. And I think, like I said, they have the most, uh, <clears throat> their coach is the craziest coach because he has the most confidence. And I think they love that, but they, they're not worried right now. Yeah. I'm not worried as well. I'm I, I'm sure that they will figure it out. And I mean, they were in the worst situation last year and now they have a Will Clyburn for their upside. So I think that they will be great because what's also important that there there was already this great bond between Vasa Misic and Shane Larkin created throughout those four or five years they're playing together. And they're, they have this great business relationship, I would say. And when Will joined the team, Okay, Larkin was out, but at least they were together. They had a lot of time to discuss how they're going to play, how, how they had a lot of time to feel each other uh, better, to see the ways they they will have to go through. And from what I heard, they really liked Will's approach. I don't know if you guys know Will Clyburn personally, but from what I've heard um, about his experience in FS, they said that he's a very humble guy, although from his looks, sometimes you might think that he doesn't care about anything, actually. But that's that's just his his him being in his zone. He's really motiv motivated both to score and to stop you defensively. He's restless. I mean, when he was playing against Karshiaka, you guys, like, it was double uh, overtime game. He was, I mean, he, he logged around... 45 or even 50 minutes something like that he was not even sitting on the bench during the timeout because you know he's he has that kind of energy uh, in himself and you know he really wants to fit in he really wants uh, to help efforts uh, to 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 have this free peat and i'm i'm sure that they're gonna be fine yeah he's um the perfect guy for that situation i mean you gotta think coming from cheska he played with chacho he played with uh, Corey higgins he played with the colo 
So he's used to playing with star power and he's a star in his own right. And I think um, you hit it on the head. He's humble. Um, he wants to win more than anything. And he does have like this demeanor, but it's just his calm demeanor where he's like, he's a killer. But if you look at his face, you look at his body language, you think like he's just so relaxed. And I think that's just because he believes in his work. He believes in his talent. And it's good because, you know, with the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of a season, sometimes it's not good to have a guy who's too emotional because when things are bad, you know, they could be a cancer. And, and when things are good, okay, they're like a, a, a ray of sunshine. But, you know, a guy like Will, he stays, he stays here. You know, he doesn't go too high, doesn't go too low. He's right here. And, you know, I think, um, like Malcolm said, I mean, they're, they're dangerous. I mean, you arguably have the three best players on the court. 95% of the nights, you know, they suit up. Yeah, and, and let's not forget that it's not only about uh, adjusting to Larkin, Misic, and Clyburn. We we shouldn't forget that Chris Singleton just joined the team. Okay, he knows the team very well, but he still needs some time to get into his better playing shape, uh, I would say. But what I think would benefit to Malcolm as well, that it's so good that Chris skipped that first part of the season. So there are only four or five months left until the end of the season. And we know that Chris Singleton was usually the guy who was playing in those big games, the biggest game mm -hmm. of the season, both in the playoffs or the last year's Final Four. So, I mean, that was another great, great signing for, for FS, you know, changing Polonara, which in Jargis, I think it will be way better fit for him. And just bringing back uh, Singleton and his physicality uh, that he shows at his best uh, when it really matters uh, for FS. Yeah, and Chris, Chris is uh, very important for them. And that was, he's actually one of the, uh, my favorite players I ever played with. You know, he, he's one of those guys that literally doesn't ask for anything. Like, he don't need a shot. He don't, like, he don't care about nothing but making the right plays. And knowing from where he came from, as you know, at the lottery pick, and, you know, when I played with him, like, he literally... I would have to beg him to shoot the ball, but he's one of the best shooters, great defender. Um, he's the perfect piece to that puzzle. He's like a, I mean, not, they don't play the same, but he's the Draymond Green of Essence. You know, not, you know, speaking specifically on his role, but how much he means to that system. Um, he doesn't get talked about enough, but like I said, he's that glue guy. He's going to make the big shots. He's going to defend the toughest matchups, you know, they switch a lot. So Chris is that focal piece that he needs, uh, that Ephes needs to put all of that together. And I think it's dangerous when you play him. You could play Chris at the five. You know, you could play him at the five or the four and you get uh, the same equal value from him and it's his importance to that team. So, you know, like you said, bringing him back with big, I don't think it's going to be a bigger adjustment for him, you know, to get back in game shape because the stuff that he does, you know, he, they can just work him into it. You're not going to see what he does or what he doesn't do. He's just going to be out there. He's not going to make mistakes. Um, he'll play his way right into shape. So I think, you know, over the next couple of weeks, that team will start to form um, better than what they have because they have people healthy now, bringing Chris back. And like I said, their confidence, Chris is a champion. Um, and now they have that, that core back together um, on that championship team. And then you add Will, I don't think it, it could get worse. It can only get better. Okay, let's go to the probably one of the most exciting parts of the podcast. Let's try to make the all-time best EuroLeague American five we had since 2000, uh, since the start of the modern EuroLeague. Honestly, I, I thought that it is going to be easy, but it was not easy at all. I was changing my 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 fives just basically before the podcast, so I'm really intrigued to hear your your five picks. Trying to put it. I wouldn't say position by position, but trying to, to make it at least backcourt and, and frontcourt uh, you have for your top five. Go ahead, Malcolm. Start it off. Let me see who you got. <laughs> it's going to be tough for me uh, historically. So we're going modern early. Um, I mean, at the five, it has to be Kyle. I mean, that's, um, I feel like that's, for me, that's a no -brain. I'm not the most historical person so I can't I don't want to leave people out or be biased um, but you know at the five position uh, it's going to have to be Kyle um, four position that's four man I might need help at the, at the wings um, 
Who did you have in your in the fours? I actually put Mike Batiste. I mean, he's like yeah. in today's basketball, he would play as only as a center. But in the in the last decade or even two decades ago, sometimes he was used as a power forward, and especially when he was playing under Obradovich, Obradovich liked yeah. those big uh, lineups. Yeah, him and Kyle together, I think. Um, I mean, they're probably the top two guys um, historically. You know, from that. Well, I mean, in general, you know, as far as winning, uh, Batiste was the most dominant. I think that uh, he was a little bit different than Kyle, but. You know, on the winning side, yeah, you know, it was. It, I think it's undeniable what he brought um, as an American uh, internationally. Uh, but wings, three man. Yeah, just just to add, I mean, Kyle was a four-time Euroleague champ. Uh, this is the only American player who won it four times in the modern Euroleague era. He ranks second in all-time scorers list, three-time Defender of the Year. I mean, he changed the Euroleague, the way the game was played. He changed the uh, approach, how we understand center position in, in, in today's basketball. And Mike was a bit opposite because he was great, great uh, of course, he had this athleticism and ability to play as a great defender at the center position, but at the same time, uh, he was averaging like at least 12 points per game and grabbing at least five rebounds and 14 performance inter index rating for six years in a row. He's a three-time EuroLeague champion and also one of the most efficient bigs that EuroLeague had and of course, Panathinaikos legend. So, I mean, these, these were quite clear picks for the front line, at least for myself, because when the conversation started with guards and with the backcourt. I mean, it was it was tough. What did you have, uh, Eric, for your front line? So for my front line, um, I had Kyle Hines as the center, um, just because his um, his uniqueness, his winning, um, the things he brings, intangibles, the player of the years defensively. Um, it seems like everywhere he goes, um, he's having a winning team. Minus this year in Milan, um, you know, he was. Uh, always a winner and successful, whether it was starting off on the lower level teams and you know, working his way up. Um, and then at power forward, I also have Mike Batiste. Um, I was trying to look for American fours and I consider Mike Batiste more of a center in this air, but like, it was really tough. Like thinking from 2000, if you went back, um, farther, I had Bob McAdoo, you know, as the best four, but, um, going 2000 and beyond, I was like, I'm just going to go two centers. I know it's tough. But I believe like the guy with Kyle Hines intelligence and, and Batiste intelligence, you know, I feel like they could find a way to make it work and it'd be effective and they control the game. Um, and then for my three position, um, I had Anthony Parker. I know he's more of a two, but he has the size of a three. Um, his domination in the early is crazy. The statistics, the efficiency, the percentages from the three, um, the, how much he won, um, how he had Maccabi as a powerhouse. Obviously, they had, you know, other good players with him but he was that driving force. So he was my three. I so, agree with you. I'll point guard, uh, well, no, I don't want to skip over that, but Anthony Parker was my pick um, at three as well. I That was one of the first players I heard about, you know, when I came mm -hmm. to Europe, it was like, that That was the that was the guy. I mean, you heard about him somewhat when he was in the league. He's like, oh, this guy came from Europe. This, he did this. But, you know, when you hear that back home, you don't really – know the value of players, um, what they did in Europe until you get in Europe. Because back home, we just felt like, you know, he was just a role player on the Cavs or whatever team he played on. He was just, and then you get over here and you see the impact he had on, like on a club. And it was, I think it was generational and it set the tone for a lot of guys because we didn't have a lot of three men, you know, who stood out in Europe. And especially back then when he played, it was tough for, you know, wings to be dominant. Uh, especially for Americans. So yeah, that that was definitely one of my picks at three as well. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a two time Euroleague champ. He made three Euroleague finals in finals in four years. The only American that actually won the Euroleague MVP award, which is crazy when you think about it. And he is also the only MVP winner that won the award in 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 back to back years. And I mean, he could score from anywhere, from from the post, beyond the arc, pull ups. I mean and he, what's most importantly, he was so efficient. I mean, from 2003 to 2005, uh, two seasons in a row, he was scoring from 16 to 18 points on 56 two-point shooting and 49 three-point shooting. And he was a great passer too. 
he was very athletic. Uh, he had a great body to 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 defend multiple positions, all around guy and very smart guy. I mean, now he's working as assistant general manager uh, in the Orlando Magic for a reason. So kudos for for AP. I, I actually think that he, he he might be the best all time American that we had uh, in the Euroleague. The only problem that we had him here only for like four seasons uh, in in this modern year league era. So okay, the longevity matters, consistency matters, but what he managed to achieve with his team and individually is outstanding. Yeah, that's great. Um, at the shooting guard position, so I was going back and forth, but I had to settle on a trade in Um, You know, mm-hmm. he was a winner. Um, he produced, um, uh, I was big on having guys who, who not only won, you know, wherever they went and, you know, were extremely successful, you know, with championships, but also who, you know, had a big part to do with that, you know, with their performance individually. And, um, you know, he was a guy that you know, really lit it up, um, could score, made big shots. And I felt like, you know, with him and Anthony Parker together, you know, lining it up for the perimeter, I feel like that's, that's a tough team right there. And a Batista Hines getting all the rebounds and doing all the little things for them. And Trayvon stuck out on on big teams. He's like, like you said, he's one of those guys that um, kind of set the tone for you know some of the bigger name clubs or the bigger money clubs letting Americans you know do their thing. And uh, you know it was, back then it was very structured systems. Uh, you know the European players genuinely felt like you know they could get it done without the american guys um and the coaches i felt like were were extremely disciplined like extremely disciplined back then so you know having a guy like that that um caliber of a score but who did it for so long and then you just see how still to this day like people speak about him it's one of those names that you know still rings the bell um in European basketball, that that just shows the impact he had. So I definitely agree um, he would fit into that spot. But you know, I'm biased, so you know, without the wins and stuff like that, you know, one of like some of my favorite twos are like like a Keith Langford, um, yeah. you know, and all time. I think he kind of got the short end of the stick just because of not being on those. He was supposed to be on good teams. It just never panned out. He was one of those guys that performed at a high level for so long. And I think um, I wouldn't put him, you know, with Trajan because of the wins. But when I think about impact of what he did for scores in Europe, um, you know, Keith set the tone. And for myself personally, you know, he was one of the guys that I, I looked at, you know, and he set the bar for scores, like, you know, and, and I watched him from college and how his game translated. I always just felt like he was the NBA player in Europe. Like every every year I seen him play, I just always thought like, why is he not NBA? Um, so on a talent level, you know, I think Keith definitely was a, a generational talent as well. Um, just because of the wins and stuff, I don't think I could put him there. But, you know, as a biased pick, <laughs> you know, yeah. for, for a key. Oh, he was. He was special. I, I'm a fan of Keith as well. Like he just made it seem so effortless. You know what? Everything he did, his movements, it looked real easy. Even though he was just looked like the person guarding him was giving it all they might, like doing everything. Yeah. And he was never sped up. Um, he always got to his spots. Um, and I love how he kind of operated in the mid range, drew the fouls, all those type of things. I, I tried to steal some things from him just because, you know, he's so special scoring wise. Like another guy, I considered putting there but i really like trajan you know shout out to the pelicans you know trajan doing a great job but um a guy you might know uh marcus brown oh you know, yeah a guy who's extremely talented um you know was a first team all year lead, second team all year lead, one of the top scores over two thousand points and everywhere he went you know he won games um whether it was at um fs um, cheska malaga zagiris maccabi um he was a guy that was really intriguing to me and i admit i had to do some research <coughs> You know, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm 35, so I'm old in basketball terms, but he's a little bit out of my my demographic age-wise. And, and I was really impressed to see the accolades and to see, you know, some of the YouTube footage on him. And, you know, I was like, oh, this is a guy who has to be, um, uh, I guess, honorable mention, you know, because I went with Trajan. Yeah, he was our Eddie Murphy. 
I remember he was doing those he was doing those impersonations when he was playing in Dragades <laughs> and through some great post game post game interviews about watching porn and and eating chicken uh, <laughs> reasons behind great behind green games he had for Dragades. I mean that guy was hilarious <laughs> and of course amazing scorer. He would have been great in the social media era, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Before his time. <laughs> and actually it's good, it's, it's good you mentioned Keith Langford uh, because until the last week he was the top scorer in all European uh, cups which includes for instance uh, which includes all the European cups since 1959 mm. let's say Euroleague BCL, BCL Euro Cup FIBA Euro Cup uh, involved and this is the information of BN Sports Greece journalist Yanis Psarakis but just Mike, Mike James he just surpassed him last week uh, scoring 23 against Fenerbahce so now Mike is actually the all-time top scorer American top scorer in the EuroLeague but also in in European uh, Cups as well so that's why I actually have him in my backcourt as well I was trying to I was trying not to be biased because Mike was just recently on 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 the Your Bonus podcast. I try not to be biased. I looked for some other players, but at, at some point I realized that I have to gr- give credit to the guy who, for like six seasons in a row, was averaging at least sixteen points per game, and he was averaging also not for let's say in in Keith ca- in Keith in Langford's case, I feel bad for him that he didn't play for a title contender. Mike played for a, ki- a title contender and he was doing great in, in, in Moscow. The problem was that one season was cut short because of COVID. Uh, in, in following years, there were some other problems, but now he is doing a great job with Monaco, making them a, a Final Four a contender. So I decided to, you know, to give credit to the all-time EuroLeague, EuroLeague scorer uh, we have in history. Yeah, I think we would have won that. We would have won that COVID year too. Just throwing that out there. You were Barcelona. great. Yeah, you Barcelona. were great. I think they robbed me for my yearly championship that year. <laughs> <laughs> it was just I got robbed. But now, nah, yeah, Mike. Uh, you know, Mike, one of my closest friends. I that would be a biased pick too. But you know, Mike is a combo. So I think you can, as much of a scorer as he is, he's he's one of the most under misunderstood players too because. You know, people see the tough shots that he makes, but Mike makes a lot of people around him better. Um, <clears throat> and you can stick him at either position. And like you said, when you look at, you know, people who did stuff over time, you know, people hate Mike's honesty and personality. But I think when it's all said and done, he'll be one of those guys, too, you know, that you have. To, like, there's no way you can't put him in a conversation because he's just done so much. You know, winning a year league definitely is important. Um, and that's why when you make a top five list, you kind of you got to find a balance on who you think is actually a better player or who you think fits into the, that that typical role because they won. And like you said, Mike played on big teams and he ended up being a star on every team you know he was on. So you definitely have to throw him into that conversation at, at either position. Yeah, I was creating a list. I was torn too, um, looking at the top. I was like, all right, Mike's accolades are undeniable. Huh? His talent, the things he's doing on the court. I mean, he's special. Like he's there's a few guys who are must see TV, you know, when you were trying to watch a year league game, and he's one of them. Like if you have your lead pads um, and you have time, you're gonna want to watch him because he's gonna put on a show. Um and I think um for sure he's probably the most talented um player um in Europe right now and has been, you know, for several years. Um with that said. I chose um, more of a, I guess he's a, Mike's a combo to me. I chose more of a, a point guard and I went with J.R. Holden. Um, you know, just some of the things he did, um, you know, in those Cheska years, um, the big shots, um, being able to lead the team, control the team. Um, I was torn between those two and I was looking at my roster and I just was like, all right, this team probably needs more of a classical point guard. And so I went with J.R., but I could fully see the point for Mike, you know, it wouldn't be an issue for me at all. Um, you know, flip-flopping either one, but I just feel like, you know, I chose so many champions and I feel like Mike is capable of winning a championship. I just like, I got to go with somebody who won a year lead. And that's kind of what made me choose J.R. Holden because, you know, he's won, you know, a few of them and, you know, he's always had you know, some of them game winning shots, um, 
you know, made a big impact, all your lead, all those type of things as well. Yeah, that's great. That's a great pick. So the question I had at point guard was, do we count uh, Kalethes as Greek or American? You know, I was wondering that same thing, too, when I was going through, because I was like, you know, Nick is a, a great lead guard. <laughs> I, I, count, I count Nick as an American. I don't count yeah. Nick as a Greek. I mean, I like literally I've been playing. I've been playing versus Nick since we were 10. Like, so it's like to me, Nick is not Greek. Yeah, but, I, I consider American, too. He's yeah, not even so speaking like, Greek, I think. Yeah. So <laughs> like, for me, like Nick is like. Uh, another guy that's not talked about enough too you know jr is like you said well respected another guy that his name holds a lot of weight um and even with mike you know mike is everything he's doing is great but i feel like as a point guard um uh, you know nick is one of the most underrated names because of you know he got thrown into the fire at an early age like and he's been doing it for so long um and still at a high level, you know, and Nick has always been the guy, like when I played against Nick, when I was 15 and people were talking about how good he was, I just didn't believe it until I got on the court. Like he's like one of those guys you see, he's like, nah, he's not that good. And then you get on the court with him, not fast, not strong, can't jump. But as a point, he's one of the smartest players I've ever seen, you know, and played against. And I think for as long as he's been doing it, you know, his name definitely has to be, you know, up there. Um, and especially, like I said, plan on a plan for a team or a club like Panathinaikos, you know, with that pressure year in and year out, I think he fully embraced, you know, European basketball, and uh, you know, you know, his his presence wherever he goes is, is high level. So I think I wouldn't put him at the top, but that's just a name. You know, Jared Holden is a great name. I said, like I said, with Mike, for me, um, you know, I think Mike is either one or two, but Nick is the sleeper for me because I don't count another Greek. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's half, half of a cheat, I would say, <coughs> but yeah, I see arguments uh, behind it. So I, I took Mike as my point guard, uh, actually, because the problem with those point guards uh, was that I, I wanted to fit the best scorers in my lineup, and the problem that the difference of the level and the quality they offer between, let's say, Mike, some other picks, and the pure point guards we had was a bit too big that I would have to, you know, put uh, Mike away. Uh, because for my shooting guard, I actually decided to go... Uh, okay, I'm also a bit biased because I'm talking about the, this generation player, but I decided to go with Shane Larkin because he's a back-to-back -back League champ, and... I would say not Barcelona, but FS was about to win that COVID uh, Euroleague season. So I think Ataman, Ergin Ataman agrees with me. He's a three-time Euroleague champion. And during that crazy season, uh, Larkin was averaging more than 25 performance uh, index uh, rating, which is yeah, incredible. Got because in, yeah, COVID exactly. It, it was the clear MVP year and the only other yearly players that managed, you know, to average at least 25 PAR was Boban Marjanovic in his crazy season in Red Star and Arev de Sabonis in his MVP year uh, 19 years ago. So that was huge. And Shane usually always shows up then when the game matters. In three title games so far, he averaged 20 points. In, in all the title games he played, which is second best average in final games, uh, only behind Dan Bodiroga. So I think it's it, it, it was huge, and, and I decided to, to pick him in my uh, all-time five, together with Mike, Anthony Parker, Mike Batiste, and Kyle Hines. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good pick. But we gotta, have a, we gotta have a separate discussion about that, that COVID year. <laughs> I, I saw Kobe <laughs> here. I saw the Kobe year a little bit different than you saw it. <laughs> oh yeah. Is it in a series? I don't see it. <laughs> I think yeah, I think y'all were the two best teams. But, I think FS I think and Barcelona. Split, yeah, I think we split with FS, but I don't know if you remember when we played FS in Barcelona, uh Pesic had an attitude with me. Um I think I had twenty in the first half and he didn't play me in the second half. And we were, I think we were winning by like 15 and Shane got hot and they beat us. Like, I think he got fouled in like eight seconds and they beat us on some free throws. But um, yeah, FS was good that year. I think 
that step for them came the following year. I think they were really good that year, but I think, um, you know, we had a, we had too much firepower um, going into a, a series with anybody. Um, and we were getting hot. That was, I think once COVID hit, we were getting hot. Like it was, it was like COVID shut down at the wrong time. I feel like that is, that was one of the best year league seasons um, top to bottom um, before COVID hit. Cause I think, you know, Seska was hot at the same time, you know, Madrid started to pick it up. I think Madrid was one or I don't remember who was one with COVID shut down, but Madrid was getting hot. Uh, FS was good. Yeah. You um, were in top three with FS uh, and Madrid. You were in a top yeah, three. Madrid, us and FS. Um, and that was like, that, that was, that was a fun year. And, That was probably the best Euro League season I've seen a player have with Shane. <laughs> like it was, it's like you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing 30 or 25. Like it, he really had, and then his shooting splits that year was crazy too. So it wasn't just, you know, the numbers he was putting up. Like he was super efficient with what he was doing. That, that was a crazy year. So I actually like that pickup. I might have to switch my shooting guard pick. That that's yes. uh and effort like it's crazy Shane's story and effort because his first year there was um I remember Ephraim was looking to try to bring in another shooting guard mm -hmm. and, you know they they just they didn't they weren't sold on him yet and then he just I felt like he changed everybody's perspective on you know smaller shooting guards um he mm -hmm. definitely opened the door for for smaller shooting guards in Europe yeah, he probably I got think... um Matt Howard uh Uh, Howard the job in Baskonia. They seem a little Shane Larkin mold. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And yeah, during that COVID year, I think Larkin, that was the year when he scored 49 against Bayer. Yeah, he was, it, it was bad. Like it was, <laughs> it was, like it, it was, it was bad. It was like every game um, was crazy. It's like every time you see it, like we checked the phones, like Larkin got 28. Third, third quarter just started. You got 25 and it's eight minutes left. Like it was, it was one of those years for a player. Like he, like, I don't know why they didn't just, they, they still should have gave out something mm. for that. Year. Like it was, he got robbed. <laughs> like he really got robbed that year. And Nick, like Miritich was having a great year too, but like, yeah. it didn't even matter. Like Shane's year was so crazy that it was like, you couldn't even debate it. Like I think, so, I think Mike got robbed for MVP. Um, but you know, like you said, all the troubles and stuff, like when he left Seska that year, I think, you know, Mike was going to be probably the MVP, um, yeah, he was sure. having that type of year, but, um, so I think Mike and Shane got the low end of the stick on the MVP list. So that you, you have to put that stamp on both of their resumes at some point. Yeah. We had many great American players. I mean, I think that 25% of American players uh, are playing right now. I mean, 25% uh, American players, yeah, they they make the EuroLeague uh, today and their impact is is, is just huge. Uh, and for the end, guys, to be really quick, what would be your quick ideas how to fix the NBA game? <coughs> I mean, we are biased EuroLeague fans. It's really Sometimes it's really hard to watch those NBA regular season games. And you've been on both sides of ocean, you know, the game on both sides of the ocean very well. What would be your ideas that you would bring to Adam Silver to improve uh, the competitiveness of, of regular season games? Maybe starting from rules, but maybe there are some other ways to, to increase, improve the product of the NBA. I think one way to do is not traditional. Um, it's something that they've kicked around the idea um, is the eliminating. Um, it's what you see in TVT. Um, kind of gives the fans a little bit more excitement. Will make guys have to play tighter. And for those who are unfamiliar with the eliminating, um, basically uh, the last um, two minutes of the game, um, the clock is stopped. So you still have a shot clock, but there's no game clock. And the leading scorer team, um, let's say the score is 82 to 80. Um, there's a target score at it. So at the last two minutes when the dead ball stops, it's plus seven. And so now the target score is 89. And so you will see teams, you know, probably being a little bit more engaged, you know, throughout the course of the game doing things. And it was something that was fun that they did, I think, um, in the G League showcase this year. Um, and they also did it in the NBA All-Star game. And you actually seen guys competing in an All-Star game. So I'm seeing if they're Doing that in an all-star game, imagine what they're doing in a real regular season game, you know, when things are on the line. And you just, you know, 
maybe it makes things more interesting in Vegas, you know, as well. You never know. But that's just, you know, something that kick started and maybe, you know, give it a little push, the Elam ending. That's yeah. a radical change you brought in, actually. <laughs> yeah, for me, I think it would be, uh, I don't think a, a rule change uh, would help the NBA because it's just the athleticism and uh, it's just too much to try to, like if, if you say you can go do the goal 10, uh, I think an NBA player are just too athletic. Um, Nobody would score. Yeah, it would just become a problem. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, shorter, uh, less amount of regular season games and adding some type of tournaments in between. Uh, because the, the regular season in the NBA is not competitive. It's all pretty much entertainment. You got you might have two guys on every team who care about winning, <laughs> you know, on a nightly basis, like people who actually care. Because with so many games, and that was one thing, when I got to the NBA, I had to adjust with, you know, I think my first year in Atlanta, we lost like four or five games straight. And I was expecting, you know, to come in the locker room and the coach be mad. And, you know, and they was just like, yo, bring it in. Like we just lost by 20 twice in a row. It was like, yo, we play tomorrow. So just bring it in and let's go. I'm like, a dude's like, yo, let's, let's go out. Like, let's, I'm like, bro, like we just lost two games. Like you're, you lose two games. Like you think about, you calling your agent, thinking you about to get replaced. So I was like, <laughs> you know, an NBA, like, the regular season really doesn't matter. Like people don't value the regular season. I think there's so many mixed emotions in regular season. You got players, you know, plan not to get traded. You got players who are free agents the next year coming up, they plan for contracts. You got teams that want young guys to play. I think the importance of every game that there's no value in every game. So I think, you know, having some sort of tournaments, um, you know, I think the Cups in Europe give people opportunities. Some of those teams that typically won't win a championship, I think, you know, once January, February come around, you know, people prepare to, if they win that Cup, that might be the biggest thing they ever did. So, you know, it, it gives more people a, a chance to be competitive, try to get, you know, a trophy. Um, and it, you know, makes the regular season more valuable because, you know, people want to play for whether it's a bonus, whether it's, you know, whatever the case may be it's more competitive trying to get into a, a, a certain situation mid, mid season. Uh, and then at the end of the season, you know, just plan for different things. I think rule changes are a little tough, but um, I think just making games more competitive, uh, you would have to find ways to do that. Yeah. I also think that just reducing the number of regular season games would really help. Let's say 17 instead of 82, uh, because it increases the importance of one victory, uh, makes players fresher. You avoid those load management situations, less back to back. So you have a better intensity, tighter defense, even more remarkable offensive performances. And I know that I think that one of the main arguments that Al Adam Silver always brings in that then in this case, players will earn less. But actually, with the current salary cap, with the new upcoming TV deal kicking in, I just don't see it as a huge issue when players are earning these amounts, uh, amounts of yeah. money. Yeah, I think um, the that's a good idea for the cup. I know, um, you know, my brother being the president of the um, NBA PA, that's something that Adam Silver has kicked around, that idea, you know, uh, midseason cup. It will create some excitement. Bonuses for the players um, on the winning team. Um I think less games is the easiest solution, but they're not going to do it because they have to have a certain amount of games broadcasted for TV rights. And then the owners will never do it because if you think numbers wise only um, a stadium, let's say average stadium in NBA, somewhere between 18 to 20,000 capacity. So let's say 20,000 for number say average ticket price in a mid market, not even the big places like LA, um, New York, mid market, you're talking about probably, $400 um, for an average ticket cost from the nosebleeds to the floor. And that's me being really cheap. Um, that's $8 million, you know, right there for the owner's pocket. That's not counting um, $6 beers, um, $8 hot dogs, um, $20 parking, um, you know, $5 Skittles. Like it's not counting any of that. That's just strictly off the purse from the door. And then you multiply that if you cut it 12 games, like you're talking about almost $100 million, $96 million in each owner's pocket. So there's no way that they'll ever do less games um, unless they created a cup and then maybe they can cut back some of the games and still make the same money. But, you know, money is, is yes. powerful and so is greed. <laughs> <laughs> that's all That's all that matters. And, I, yeah. <laughs> and that's the biggest problem. You know what I'm saying? That's the biggest problem. And it, 
it translates onto the players as well. It's like, all right, well, you know, they, they won't vote for left game because now, like you said, there's people just like the owners that think about that as players thinking, you know, I got 12 more games, uh, you know what I'm saying? This, this free agency year, I got to, I need every game I could, I could take and taking days off and taking rest for the younger guys. It's not as important for the older guys. You know, I'm pretty sure they would, they would be for it. You know, they sit out mm-hmm. those games anyway, so they wouldn't care whether they play 12 or 20 less games, but for those, you know, young guys, the, the young stars in the league, I feel like, you know, they want to play. Yeah. So, and that's the, and that's the balance. And it's good. Like your brother is now, you know, in, in a head seat where you don't have an older guy that, you know, they only thinking pretty much for the older guys, you got somebody who can see both sides of the stick mm-hmm. um, and have that balance in between what the young players need and what the older players, you know, have already brought into the league. Uh, and then find that middle ground and try to, you know, be that mediator between the two. And I think another thing that they could do is the NBA could create some type of incentive um, for guys who play <laughs> games, um, a certain amount of games. So that would stop those stars from sitting out. So for those fans who come, let's say a kid and a, a father, you know, wants to take his son to a game and, you know, you want to see Steph Curry, but, you know, it's a rest week uh, for him or a rest game, you know. So I think, you know, some guys are so rich, it won't really matter. Um, they got so much off the court on the court, they won't care. But, you know, for some people, they might, I think like those mid-star level guys, like they'll play. Um, and all the young players will play for sure. But it's just to the point where guys, the money's astronomical. Like they're going to do what they want to do. And there's nothing really the NBA can do because it's a player's lead. And it's interesting. The yearly uh, guy says he wants it the yearly to be a player's lead. I, we'll probably be long dead before that happens, Malcolm. Like, but <laughs> we see that, man. I, it'll never happen. Why you're so spe- Why are you so skeptical? It, it would never like the coaches would never allow it. The style, like that's what makes Europe, I guess, different from America is that the coach has all the power. Um, and you know, it's what's worked for them. You know, it hasn't worked um financially when you're talking about compared to the NBA, but it's worked for them as far as putting together a good product, having good games and creating that passion because Europe is like college. So like um you have a lot of people who are fans of a team, not a player. Where the NBA, people are LeBron fans, so they go wherever he go. People are um Kyrie fans, people are whatever player they like, they jump from team to team. But you don't see that if you're a Zagiris fan. You're there, whether Evans is there or he leaves, whether Pangos is there, like it doesn't change. And I think, you know, with that college feel, college, you're controlled, players are controlled. Um, like, I mean, it got to the point where the year league players association, just to get your own room. I mean, they had to go and do something like it's just it, it's so far, it's so far removed. Like you if you do anything interesting outside of basketball, like you would receive flack. Like now I'm older. And so like when I do my podcast, when I do that certain stuff, coaches know my professionalism, they know what I do. They don't mind because they know I'm going to handle the business. But if I was 25 years old and I was trying to talk to you on a podcast, they would say, I'm not serious. I'm not focused on basketball. And it didn't matter if I went out there and I produced and I shot the ball. Well, if I scored, we won, they would say I'm not focused. And that's the difference between Europe being a player association because they think all we can do is play basketball. Like you, you can't have a life. Well, one day you're not gonna be able to bounce a ball. And if you can't start to pivot and think about the future, what are you going to do? Yeah. And that's the biggest thing about Europe. It's not about, I don't think many people care about the future. <laughs> it's more so about right now, basketball right now. Yeah, for some reason, Eric just left uh, the conversation. I don't know if it's like yearly head coaches board or somebody yes. from from the head coaching department killing these players league ideas. But <laughs> somebody somebody disconnected him as soon as he started talking about. See, I'm, I'm not under contract, so I'm not, <laughs> my my I'm, I'm free. <laughs> Anyway, I was just about to wrap it up. Uh, I, I believe it was a great quality uh, talk. Eric, uh, of course, he's the, probably the best podcaster here in European soil, soil, I would say. And Malcolm, it was a pleasure to hear your thoughts. You always had these deep insights. And I just hope to see you not on the screen, but maybe on the floor, maybe in Jalgir Arena and not necessarily playing for Jalgiris, but maybe for a opposite team and maybe making the final four journey. I don't know, but but somewhere closer uh, here. We'll see. How, uh, I'm, I'm, I know in, in the summertime, like I told you, I was completely 
removed from basketball. So I wasn't even talking. I didn't even want to waste anybody's time and even talk to him. But um, it's a little bit different now. Like I said, I, I told everybody last year I didn't want to play a 10-month season. Um, you know, it was possibly my last year in Europe, which is still, you know, a strong possibility. But, um, you know, like I said, I'm having fun right now. I'm getting back in the gym, getting in shape. Uh, if a, a great situation comes across the table that I think could help benefit me and benefit the team, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely open to it. I'm not really pressed to do it, but um, we'll see. You know, I'm definitely open to the conversation and see, you know, what happens. Eric, was it yearly head coach's board that cut you off from this podcast when you start uh. pushing this Players League idea? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I had a, had a little malfunction, but um, it's just, <laughs> it's just something, I mean, I would love to see it, but just based on my experience, I've been doing this 13 years, and I think they're, I don't want to say intimidated, but they're afraid to lose control. Um, and I think um, with the coach's powers, decision make, I mean, like I've been on teams where if a player, let's say, you know, wants to buy his own room, you know, sometimes coaches are ex upset, you know, just because he wants his own space. I mean, you got to think we're grown men and like, you're buying your own room. You're not using the team's money. You're not up to nothing. Like you just literally want your own space because a lot of times in these hotels, the beds are really small. So you're talking about somebody who might be six, eight, six, nine. And like, I'm feeling small in the bed and I'm six, two. So imagine like these big guys, uh, or you might be stuck with the roommate who goes to bed early and you want to be respectful, you know, him because in America it's an eight hour time difference. Like little things like that, if that it upsets coaches and teams, a room, um, I mean, even like family traveling um, on a different on a, on a flight that you paid for, but you want them to go to an away game. Um, that can be an issue for some teams. Um, like, let's say your wife is there and she loves basketball. She wants to support you. And it's only an hour or two flight. Like, you know, and they have a problem with that. If they stay in a hotel, like, it just depends. Every team is it's not the same. So until they can fix these little issues, I don't see how it could ever be a player's lead. And, you know, I'm not complaining. I knew what I signed up for. I did 13 years um, over here. I understand that there's a lot of perks. I'm blessed to play this game. I'm blessed to get paid for a living. It allowed me to take care of myself, my family. And, and I just chalked it and took the L. Like, I knew this is how it is. But, you know, the truth is the truth. And a lot of people won't like to hear it. They'll say we're complaining or we're spoiled. But I'm just telling you why it won't be a player's lead. You can be upset or not. It's your choice. But this is why it will never be until these little things can be changed. Because if you're worried about little things, you'll never accept the big things on the court. Like, even, like, some point guards don't even have freedom to call plays. Like, and they might be experienced or not. Like, the coach might call every play. Like, these little things, like, you just don't know until you're a player. Yeah, and off that, that off-the-court stuff is, is very important. And that was, like you said, you know, having a glass of wine after a game. Like, you couldn't, have, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you couldn't. Do, like, you literally, they wanted you to be a robot, play, practice, be in your room. Like, you could have friends or family on the opposite team. You ask the team, you know, can you go to dinner with them? Um, you know, no. Like, you have to eat the same thing for 10 months. Like, that That was some of the stuff, you know, for me um, that I kind of got tired of. But I got lucky, you know, I think with my last um, three teams, you know, I think Coach Barzokas was, the, was probably my favorite coach because he was the first coach who kind of, you know, like you said, he he wanted to make sure everybody was happy. So when they came to work, you know, they did their job. And that was like, you know, if you wanted to take your family on a trip, you know, when he told us the rules we had, you know, I thought, I was like, this can't be a European coach. Like, you know, he was like, you know, if you, have, you get three trips, you know, your family want to travel with you, they can travel on a plane, you can stay in the same room. You know what I'm saying? I'll give you guys, you know, three trips where it is or if we play in a good city, we got the next day off or two days off, like y'all can stay as long as you, you're back before practice or, you know, stuff like that. We used to be like, that's amazing. You know? And that that's made amazing. Us, <laughs> I remember we had a, we had a trip and this is just off topic, but when we was in locomotive, you know, I wasn't supposed to be there. I was actually going to leave um, because they were cutting the budget. And, you know, Coach Barzokas, um, he wanted me for pretty much my whole career. And, you know, he told them like, yo, I can believe I'm leaving. So, you know, that was the first time I seen a coach actually like go against the club for a player. And I was like, I was like, this dude, he's been showing interest in me, but 
them. Like, I've never heard a player threaten the club. Like, I mean, a coach threaten the club and say, like, you know, I built the team around this guy. If he leaves, I'm out too. And, you know, moving forward, we had a, I think, a game. They were cutting the budget. We had bad flights. And, you know, Eric, you played in Loco, so you know how the travel is there. We had, like, the worst travel where we were staying in, you know, uh, Moscow for six hours at a time, every layover. And, you know, we lost the game. And we got back. They had a meeting with us in the airport. And the owner was just like, yo, like, y'all got to stop losing games. And Barzoka just stood up and he was like, you know, you give us the worst flights. You know, we got, um, you know, Fasinko on the team. He's six, well, seven feet, 300 pounds. You got managers sitting in extra rows, but Fasinko is sitting in a regular tier. Um, he was like, what do you expect from my team if, you know, He's like, I don't expect my team to win with the way you guys will treat me. He was like, if you want us to win games, you need to, you know, change your approach on how you treat the players. And after that meeting, everybody looked at Coach Barzola was like, yo, like, this dude really cares about the players. And, you know, like I said, he implemented certain stuff where it was like, we always had a day off after. And this was before everybody was doing it. Like, every game we had, we had a day off. I don't care you know, what it was. We could have game two or three days later. You had a day off the rest. Um, like I said, he didn't care. If you had a, a friend on another team and you said, look, coach, you know, can I go eat dinner with my friend? You didn't have to go to a team dinner to eat the same, you know, trash food for 10 months. If you had a friend on another team, he trusted that his player would go to dinner, be responsible, come back, you know, at a reasonable time and go to work. And I think, you know, that took us over the top that year. And a lot of people was wondering, you know, why our team was so, um, we had, uh, we were together so much. And it's because off the court, you know, we were the same as on the court. And in Europe, that's not a thing. It's like, this is how it is, buy into it or don't. And that's why you see guys like a Mike who, you know, can kill in Seska, but also him and the coach are not on the same page because of the typical, you know, European mentality or you, you see, you know, my situation in Barcelona, you know, we had a great team, but, you know, me and Pesic, you know, it was just like a, it was a feud between like small stuff. It was stupid stuff. Now that you look at it, it's like, like Eric said, until you get that small stuff, like those small things out of the way, you could never take that next step into, well, it'll never be a player's league, but to make players feel more comfortable, you know, being themselves off the court as well. And I think it'll translate better to European basketball because, you know, once players get their freedom and their happiness off the court, it, it, it does nothing but make them better basketball players. And, you know, you know, having that strong foundation with these players and the coaches and, and these, these clubs, um, that's the next step of European basketball. I think, and once it makes that step, I think you'll see a better product. Wow, some some great thoughts, and especially that's huge to hear about Coach Coach Barzokas. Maybe that, and now it kind of explains a lot why Olympiakos was so successful in recent years, having this core, and you just feel that great team chemistry, which also starts from the coaching staff. You know, watching them play. I mean, that that explains a lot. What you have said about about Coach Barzokas that explains a lot the way Olympiakos plays and thrives yeah. uh, in yeah. the recent years. And that's why all his team, you see, no matter who he has. And, you know, when he was in Olympiacos at first, like, everybody loved, like, I, don't, I haven't met many players who, you know, hate him. Like, there's no way, like, there's no way you can hate what he does. Like, his practices, like, how he treats his players, his communication. You know, you might see him on the sideline and, like, this guy's crazy, but, you know what I'm saying? But for the players, like, he, he was definitely, and he still is. Messina was pretty good after he came back from, um, San Antonio, as far as like the off the court stuff, he didn't really bother with people like practices, um, load management. He was really good with that stuff. Um, but Coach Barzola, I've never seen a, a coach give the players um, as much freedom as Coach Barzola's. And it was it wasn't just freedom. He just trusted. I, I would say he trusted his players more uh, than any other coach. After this pod, I see so many Olympiacos fans just texting and tweeting, oh, Malcolm, join us. Join us for the Final Four campaign. <laughs> yeah, look, I've been, look, since Barzogas was there, uh, was it 2013? When I left, they wanted to buy me out when I was in uh, Munich. So since then, um, since I played in Munich, like it's, it's been every summer, like <laughs> since 2013, every summer I've been connected to Olympiacos. 
<laughs> Coach Barzell just hasn't called me yet, for the record. Olympiacos <laughs> fans. I haven't got that call yet. <laughs> Thank, thanks for clarifying your, your situation. Let's wrap it up for the second time. When Eric, Eric was gone, I've just said that I'm glad to have the best podcaster on the European soil, as, as Eric McCollum is. And of course, as I said, I would just... I wish to see Malcolm soon, not on my screen, but on European floors, I would say, and in Jalgarina maybe for the Final Four event. It was great to have you here. It was a quality time, and I hope that not only the fans, but also people who make decisions uh, will hear those thoughts and will will improve their decision-making maker uh, making looking forward. I'm, available. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, it was great talk. Thank y'all. I appreciate y'all. Any anytime y'all need, you know, I'll, I'll mind.